Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I wanted to just make a couple postscript types of remarks about our meeting last month. I made an error of geography. We were talking about the hyperinflation in Zimbabwe. And I think I ended up saying something in Zimbabwe used to be, uh, or the Democratic Republic of Congo used to be Zimbabwe, which no, Zimbabwe still exists. It's Zaire. I knew it started with a Z. So the, the moral of the story is if you're looking to become expert in African geography, don't come my direction because I'm not the expert. But it was interesting because I did look up what's happened with Zimbabwe since the hyperinflation because I showed you the $100 trillion Zimbabwe note. And of course that's worthless. And for a while they used the currencies of neighboring countries and even US dollars because their own currency just imploded, was totally worthless. They have since come up with the new currency, but they're not doing a whole lot better. The inflation rate for recent years has fluctuated anywhere from 50 or 60% up to over 800%. So the, the paper money experiment is still not working well in Zimbabwe. Also, somebody asked a great question about minimum wage, and I made several points. Let me just add one more point, and that is to remember the, the minimum wage, like, like any price in a market, it, it's a signal. And it signals to workers that they need to advance. They need to acquire more skills. You, you can't live on a minimum wage job. They're not designed to support you full-time. They're entry-level jobs to give young, primarily young people some experience. It also gives some retirees a chance to earn some cheap part-time income just to keep them busy. But it's a very important signal on the marketplace. I, one of the best jobs I ever had, I was paid minimum wage, but I only stayed with it a few months because I couldn't afford to. The market was saying, move on. And ultimately we have to do what the market tells us to do. Okay, tonight I'm gonna to talk a little bit about climate change and its economic impacts. I've, I wrote a book about five years ago. It's just an ebook published by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, cfact.org, uh, called uh, The Big Picture, The Science, Politics, and Economics of Climate Change. It's this topic I've been interested in for decades now. And so I've, I'm, I'm going to be reading part of the time just so that I don't totally go off on a tangent and just get carried away. I'd like to start by reading a couple of sentences from President Dwight Eisenhower's farewell address in 1961. That address is famous because of the reference he made to the military industrial complex. Okay, a few paragraphs after that though, he makes another interesting comment. He said, the prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocation, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. And he said, there's also the danger that the public, that public policy could itself become captive of a scientific technological elite. And I think the closest we've come to fulfilling that warning or the prophecy is with the climate change. And I call it the climate change cabal because it behaves like a cabal. They, there's a lot of dirty pool being played here and, um, and money is playing a huge part in the shaping of, of, of public opinion. Um, the, uh, why, well, first of all, uh, you mentioned domination of the scholars. Federal grants for scientific research have been largely dependent in the last few decades on where scientists stand in regard to the climate change issue. If they're willing to go along, at least to some extent, with the notion that human activity is radically and dangerously changing Earth's climate so that it's about to precipitate a crisis, and the only way we can get out of it is by a massive economic and social transformation, well, that's, uh, that, those are the people that get the money. And if you're not willing to play ball, uh, there have been careers that have been ruined. There have been people suddenly fired. I've heard anecdotes of professors telling of their 
college or university's provost or president coming to them and saying, look, you know, you got to play along with this. It even extends into the social sciences. I mean, if somebody teaching economics at a university could be told, look, don't, don't question this because we'll lose big bucks from the federal funding. So the, the federal government's playing hardball to promote this particular agenda. And the result is we end up with something that I, the best characterization I've heard of is, is called official science. And of course, that's not science. You know, the, the official party line is more what I would call it. And that's the notion that human behavior is about to precipitate a crisis and therefore radical measures are, are called for. Um, just as a little bit of, to flesh it out with some numbers here, I, I, I've got several sources. One science vlogger, uh, an Australian woman named Joe Nova, she, I've got a lot of respect for her. She wrote a few years back that the US government has channeled 3,500 times as much federal funding to scientists whose work can be construed as supporting the theory of catastrophic climate change, as opposed to those who perhaps question that theory. That's an obvious you know, imbalance there. In 2007, congressional staffer Mark Morano, who runs the climatedepot.com website today, he calculated that approximately 19 million, now that's million with an M, 19 million in federal grants had gone to skeptics of global warming, catastrophic climate change, compared to 50 billion, that's billion with a B. So in other words, 2,500 times as much uh, money went to those. So, you know, they, they don't have the exact numbers. And part of it is that federal bureaucrats aren't, uh, bureaucracies aren't the most transparent organizations, but there's been a very, very clear tilting of the table, shall we say, um, from the 20 years, 1993 to 2013, federal spending on climate change exceeded $165 billion. So we're talking big money and it wields big influence. And what are people trying to get out of this? Well, their motives are, are several. Some are doing it for the money. Unfortunately, some of our colleges, some are doing it for power. And some, I think, have an anti-American agenda, and they're working hand in glove with, with foreign interests. One more comment about the influence or the uh, manipulation, the pressure being put on professors and academic figures. There's a Czech physicist who says, during my years in US academia, I experienced a couple of events related to the global warming propaganda that I found stunning. Scientists around me and myself were subjects of intimidation, even disciplinary proceedings. Some were even instantly fired simply because they had skeptical views about climate change. He said the similarity of the environmentalist techniques are reminiscent of the Nazis and the communists. And remember, this is a guy from the Czech Republic. I mean, they, they were under the control of Moscow until, uh, you know, 1990-ish. So some of the money interest, we see this today. I mean, Al Gore has become a multi, multi, multi-millionaire because he's gotten involved with these green energy projects. So have other millionaires, you know, Richard Branson, um, Michael Bloomberg, and others. If you want to see an interesting expose of some of these, I, last night for the second time I watched it's free online. It's a, a video produced by Michael Moore, you know, the, the leftist uh, muckraker. And um, it's called Planet of the Humans. And indeed, it has kind of a couple leftist themes. I mean, the capitalists are the bad guys, and the world's got too many people, and it's bad, 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 bad. But a lot of that video has to do with exposing what a con the green energy endeavors are. Uh, wonderful to see the left wing exposing some of the chicanery and machinations going on there. But you know, green boondoggles have been going on for decades. I remember when Jimmy Carter was president, there was 
an organization called Sin Fuels, uh, Synthetic Fuels, that was supposed to uh, supplant our, our use of natural petroleum. Didn't happen, went bankrupt. Under President Obama, Solyndra, you know, a solar energy firm, dozens of these firms have taken tens of millions of dollars of federal money and gone bankrupt. And the people that started the companies do quite well. They, they end up pulling millions out of it. They tend to be political contributors to the party in power. I'm gonna make a very serious charge here that the primary motive of the climate change movement, the, the ones saying that it's humans are and fossil fuel consumption by humans is going to jeopardize the world and we need a change. They're not primarily concerned about the climate. Their primary goal is simply some form of socialism. They want power, they want control. Now that's a very serious allegation to make. So rather than have you trust my word for it, I'm just gonna read you some direct quotes from some of these people. Uh, a couple of decades ago, former pr French President Jacques Chirac endorsed the United Nations framework for addressing global warming. He said, for the first time, humanity is instituting a genuine instrument of global governance, which France and the European Union would like to see established. A senior official of the IPCC, that, that's the UN agency that oversees their global warming research and propaganda. It stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Notice it's intergovernmental. It's not international scientists. They bring together scientists, but the constitutional structure of that organization gives power to the political leaders to revise anything that the scientists produce from their research and often they directly contradict what their own scientists have found in their research. So some scientists go, you know, play along with it willingly. Others resent it greatly, but they're, they're kind of in a corner because the political people have all the power. This man's name is Atmar Edenhofer, senior official IPCC. Quote, one has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. Instead, climate change policy is about how we redistribute the world's wealth, close quote. Another one of these insiders is a woman named Christine Stewart, former Canadian minister of the environment, quote, no matter if the science of global warming is all phony, Climate change provides the greatest opportunity to bring about justice and equality in the world, close quote. Christiana Figueres, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, quote, we are setting ourselves the task of intentionally changing the economic development model that has been reigning for at least 150 years, close quote. The 2009 Global Green New Deal report, quote, we must not miss this chance to fundamentally shift the tra trajectory of human civilization, close quote. And here's maybe the most recent one, Saikat Chakrabarty. He was the chief of staff of AOC, Ocasio-Cortez. Quote, the Green New Deal, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. The Green New Deal, wasn't originally a climate thing at all. We really think of it as a, how do you change the entire economy thing, close quote. So you see, I mean, this, this is about something other than the climate. The climate's the pretext. The climate's what, the issue that they're grabbing onto to advance a primarily socialistic um, agenda. And as you know, AOC you know, has publicized her Green New Deal when, you know, about, uh, I don't know, when did she first get into Congress? I guess about five years ago now, whatever, five, four, five, six years ago. But here's what the Green New Deal calls for. 
This is this is this is, and it's partly been enacted by some of Joe Biden's uh, recent trillion dollar spending bills. But the Green New Deal calls for the elimination of fossil fuels in a mere ten years. You know, close all the gas stations, replace them with electric charging stations, replace or retool tens of millions of vehicles that travel by land, sea, or air. Although she was candid enough to say this, quote, we aren't sure we'll be able to get rid of airplanes in 10 years, close quote. Get rid of airplanes? Ouch. She, Green New Deal also calls for replacing all power plants that use fossil fuels with wind and solar. That's kind of tough when you're getting in like close to 80% of your energy from fossil fuels. Ending all jobs involved in the exploration, extraction, refining, and transportation of fossil fuels. But also the Green New Deal says, let's retrofit every building in America. Let's overhaul transportation and agriculture. Let's provide job training and education to all. Let's guarantee a job with family sustaining wages. Let's provide high quality health care and housing to all and ensure universal access to healthy food. That's a rather ambitious agenda. And obviously it's not something that is spontaneously emerging in the marketplace. It's a socialist vision for transforming society. In fact, under her own frequently asked questions in describing the New Deal, she says that it's the Green New Deal is quote, the plan, notice the arrogance there, not a plan, the plan to build a new economy. Ouch. Interestingly, the guy that is co-sponsoring that is Senator Edward Markey from Massachusetts. <laughs> he praised the Green New Deal as a, quote, mission to save all of creation by engaging in mass job creation. So he wants to save the universe. There's a messianic mentality. You know, it's utopianism can be very dangerous. You know, this ideal perfect world, the only way you can get it is to arrogate to yourself immense power. I mean, it's, it's dictatorial and totalitarian in its, uh, in its thrust. Um, I also want to point out again, some of the skullduggery that goes on. Here's a fierce uh, criticism of the IPCC by a socialist founder of Germany's environmental movement. So, you know, I'm not choosing my sources here as like fellow conservatives, fellow free market economists. This guy's a socialist and a greenie from Germany, which is one of the greenest of the, of the countries. He has come right out and said, that the IPCC, he's accusing them of gross incompetence and dishonesty, especially with their fear mongering about human carbon dioxide emissions. So, you know, that IC, IPCC is not the most trustworthy or impartial or scientifically balanced source we can refer to. Um, I mentioned an international agenda. The UN, of course, is always pushing for global redistribution of wealth. That's what the Paris Accord of, nine, of 2015 was that President Trump eventually pulled us out of, but its primary provision was simply redistributing wealth from richer countries to poorer countries in the name of environmental justice. And that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, goal number 10 of the United Nations Agenda 2030 aims to quote, reduce inequality within and among countries. And that's only gonna be possible if wealth is shared, in other words, redistributed. And the goal, and this is a quote also, the goal is making fundamental changes in the way our societies produce and consume goods and services. In other words, how we live. I mean, basically change the the work world changed our private world at home, you know, how we consume, my goodness. Along the way in my research, I found that in 1990, Mikhail Gorbachev had assembled a conference in Moscow. And he said this, quote, the threat of environmental crisis will be the international disaster key to unlock the new world order. 
So again, you hear echoes of some of these UN officials saying the same thing, or Jacques Chirac, we're gonna change the whole order of the world. And Gorbachev wanted to do it too. And he saw environmentalism as being the key issue to get the camel's nose under the edge of the tent. He called for an international green organization to further that agenda. I think the IPCC is fulfilling that agenda quite well. Gorbachev's plan included having environmental scare stories concocted and disseminated by pro-Moscow sympathizers and gullible dupes in academia, the sciences, and the press. Yeah, because look, Russia today, Soviet Union, but Russia today, is one of the world's leading producers of fossil fuels. So if you can get the United States to somehow think that they're in the wrong by producing fossil fuels themselves, if you can get the United States to hamstring itself, to hamstring domestic production of fossil fuels, what does that do for Russia? It enables them to take over more of the market. The Russians aren't interested in climate change. They're not afraid of this, they know it's a hoax. I mean, the, the, look, the climate's changing. It always has and it always will. And I'll get into a little bit more of the detail of that later. You folks have nothing to worry about here from the climate. It's the people who want to fix the climate. You have a lot to worry about. There's a lot of uh, evidence today of Russian involvement in these domestic anti-fracking and anti-pipeline campaigns. There's a retired CIA officer who pursued the money trail that leads from Russian energy interests through Bermuda to various US environmental groups. And that kind of struck a response chord with me because I can remember in the 1970s being a young teacher and I would give five bucks here and five bucks there to some environmental group. But then I started noticing they were doing crazy things like uh, calling for nuclear disarmament in the States, but not in the Soviet Union. You know, they had a very, one-sided agenda. Well, I, I think that there's, what we have here is considerable evidence of foreign influence that's trying to undermine American sovereignty and, and just put our country at a tremendous disadvantage by working with agents of influence here in our own country. You know, the, the people who get kind of hysterical about climate change. I, I came across an example this recently, wrote an article for the Epic Times about it. There's a website called axios.com. And he came out with an article about how artificial intelligence is now working with computer models that deal with climate change and saying, hey, you know, maybe these changes are happening even faster. Of course, you remember the first rule of computers is garbage in, garbage out. The models themselves have never been accurate. They've never conformed to the real world. And so artificial intelligence trying to massage those um, climate computer models, are, are, that's not gonna have any more success. But here's where he gives off his bias right at the start. He says, the world is already suffering. That's his verb and the, that's the key the word in this sense. The world is already suffering the impacts of 1.1 degrees Celsius, that's almost two degrees Fahrenheit, of warming to date. Suffering? The warming that he's talking about is the warming that's happened since the mid 1800s, which happened to be when the world was coming out of a multi-century cold period called the Little Ice Age, the coldest period in the last 9,000 years. There was a lot more suffering during the Little Ice Age than in our slightly warmer world today. Even the Lancet, which is a London medical journal, uh, says you know there's the fatality rate is 20 times as great from cold as from heat. You know, cold causes a lot more human deaths than heat does. So yeah, our our world, uh, the carbon dioxide especially, that's where there's been rapid growth since the 1890s, we're up to, we've gone from approximately 290 parts per million in our atmosphere to like 420 parts per million. That's a noticeable increase. But has it caused suffering? I submit it's caused just the opposite. I think it's been a boom. You know, we've had this warming. So we get, you know, the and, and in the Northern hemisphere that's mostly translated into milder winters and milder winter nights. 
longer growing seasons. So we get more agricultural productivity, but we especially are getting more agricultural productivity from the greening of the planet by carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the ultimate basic plant food. You would think environmentalists who like to call themselves greens would be delighted at the greening that's happened around the globe in the last four plus decades, 40 to 50 years. An area of the world's land surface equal to twice the size of the lower 48 states has gone green. The Sahara Desert has shrunk by almost 10%. And, era, and uh, I never realized quite how big the Sahara Desert. What is eight or 9% of the Sahara Desert? Well, it's almost as big as France and Germany combined. And that much of the Sahara Desert has gone green. So the world's getting greener. Agricultural pro productivity is much improved because of the carbon dioxide enrichment. It also helps plants use water more efficiently so they're more drought tolerant. So it's been a huge boon to agricultural production, which comes in handy when you're dealing with feeding 8 billion people as there are in the world today. And as, as I said, there are so many fewer deaths from hot weather than there's from cold weather. And perhaps most glorious of all, and what we should really be grateful for is that since 1920, the death rate from weather-related incidents, and there's a big debate, you know, what's weather, what's climate, but it's gone down 99% because as the human race becomes wealthier, you know, we're able to build sounder structures, we're able to figure out how to build barriers against, you know, flood, flood, flood walls, et cetera, communication, early warnings to get people out of harm's way, et cetera, et cetera. So when a writer comes out and says, oh, gee, we've already suffered so much from the climate change in the last, you know, 170 years, man, if what we've had is suffering, I want a whole lot more of it. And then, well, okay, but, but in the future, it's going to be worse. You know, you can have too much of a good thing. Okay, I agree with that as general principle. But we're kind of a long way away from that. I mean, we're just now getting kind of close to where the temperatures were higher in the medieval warm period. And then you go back a couple thousand years to the Roman period, it was even warmer then. And you go back about 3,500 years to the Minoan period, it was even warmer then. I mean, each of those previous historical epochs were warmer than today. And guess what? Every time it was really warm, civilization flourished. So the idea that if it gets warmer, we're all, you know, it's going to be like Cinderella's carriage turning back into a pumpkin and we're all going to drown or something. It just, it just doesn't make sense. The world's, you know, first of all, humans are adaptable. And secondly, these, these kinds of things have happened before. Um, you know, it's interesting, just give you some, some data. Uh, in the, is carbon dioxide to blame? Well, no, I mean, in the three previous ice ages, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide was a lot higher then than it is today. Well, wait a minute, isn't carbon dioxide in the atmosphere supposed to make the world warmer? Well, it hasn't in the past. It's just the alarmists who say, oh yeah, yeah. And these are the same people, by the way, in the 1970s who say, watch out, we're gonna into an ice age. Uh, there, there's money to be made and fame to be made in coming up with hysterical predictions, but don't take them to the bank. Don't take them seriously. And um, the three previous interglacials, the warm periods in between the ice ages, they were all warmer than today, but in at least a couple of those cases, they had lower concentrations of CO2. And I've, I've seen the graph that goes back like half a billion years the correlation between global temperatures and CO2 in the atmosphere. There's no correlation. They're just, it's, it's random movements. So not to worry, it's, it's, uh, it, it just isn't um, the danger that they, they, they say it is. Okay. Let me uh, 
get into some of the economic costs of this, uh, these attempts to avert catastrophic climate change, it sure isn't cheap. One of the arguments the proponents make for switching from fossil fuels to what they call renewables, I prefer to call them intermittent sources of energy because when the wind doesn't blow, the wind turbines don't generate power. And when the sun doesn't shine, that the, the, the solar panels don't get any energy. So they're intermittent sources, they're less reliable sources. But they say, ah, but they create a lot more jobs than fossil fuels do. But if you understand economics, you go, that's not a good thing. How does a society as a whole become more prosperous and, and increase standards of living? Well, it, it does it by human labor becoming more productive. You know, if, if, if a man's hour of labor can produce 10 units, whereas before it only produced five units, you're getting wealthier. If you can produce more energy with fewer workers, your productivity has increased and that leaves workers free to produce things other than energy. So really what you want is you want a smaller number of people producing the energy that society needs to come out with these programs and say, hey, it creates a whole lot more jobs. Yeah, but you're overall economically, you're dragging down society. You're using more labor to produce energy than you had to before. So the renewables, the intermittent sources of energy really aren't the great job. I mean, they create jobs, but they're less productive jobs. And so they, they make society poorer. Um, the economist Mark Perry came out a few years ago with a study. He found that uh, equal amounts of electricity were produced by one coal worker, two natural gas workers, and 79 solar workers. So coal is the one that's most cost effective. I'm not an advocate for coal. I think it's, you know, the way it pollutes the atmosphere. I mean, developing countries may need it because being without energy is the road to poverty. One of the tightest correlations in economic development is the correlation between energy consumption and higher standards of living. You look at a history of standards of living in the world, it's just a flat line for millennia, millennia, millennia. And then in the last two or 300 years, it's like, it's zoomed and it's gone parabolic. It's all been due to energy and technology, but it's the energy that powers the technology that's really the key. Fossil fuels are absolutely essential for the economic development of Western society. We should be grateful for it. And going to these less efficient energy sources is an economic step backwards. We've been made to pay more for energy in recent years than a free market would have the prices a free market would have produced. And how can I say it? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious. These intermittent sources of energy, solar and wind, have received massive government subsidies for years. If they were cost competitive with fossil fuels, we would probably turn to them without, we would turn to them without any government intervention unless we found that the the externalities, the side effects were greater and we're finding that the environmental side effects of these renewables is probably more severe, has a more negative impact environmentally than natural gas and oil do. But the fact that they require subsidies to be competitive means that you know we're paying more to use a less efficient form of energy which means we have less of our personal wealth left to consume other things. In other words, these are retarding our, the renewables and the subsidies that go to support the renewables 
those are retarding our economic progress. They're slowing it down. Bad news. Dollar figures. May 19, sorry, I keep saying 19, I'm living in the past. May 2017, UN climate negotiators in Bonn, Germany, prepared a report. Remember, this is the UN, so their big kick is redistributing wealth. So they were proposing a $300 billion per year tax from the prosperous countries to the less prosperous countries. They also wanted to give them to environmentalist NGOs to, to, to give out. Boy, talk about an opportunity for corruption. But 800, uh, or excuse me, $300 billion a year, that, that's chicken feed compared to some of the proposals. The United Nations came out with a different report that concluded, and this is the, these are the people that want to transform our society, that are pushing the alarmist agenda. You'd think they'd want to make it sound like a good deal, but the United Nations themselves said the dollar cost of reducing human fossil fuel consumption enough to shave a few hundredths of a degree off global temperatures, a few hundredths of a degree, that's within the margin of error. That's, that's not even detectable, but they're saying, well, we can shave off a few hundredths of a degree of global temperature and all it'll cost around the planet will be about $553 trillion, trillion dollars over the course of the 21st century. Well, when the global GDP is maybe a hundred trillion, to talk about devoting five, over 500 trillion to anything, to take five years of the world's wealth and devote it to any goal is unrealistic. I mean, what are the people gonna live on? And get this, <laughs> Bjorn Lomborg, who really stays on top of this stuff. I, he's, he's a good worker. The largest database on climate scenarios shows that keeping temperature rises to two degrees Celsius, that's not as severe even as the net zero you hear people talking about, but just to confine the temperature rise, supposedly, assuming they can control it, which is a very dangerous assumption. I mean, I don't think we can control the climate any more than we can control the tides. We can get into that a little bit later. He said it would likely cost 8.3 trillion every year by 2050. And by the time we get to the end of the century, about one quadrillion dollars. I don't think I've ever heard anything <laughs> expressed in terms of a quadrillion before. Yeah, I think I told you in one of my earlier lectures, it just so you can get the scale here, if you take $100 bills and stack them flat. For a 40 inch stack of $100 bills is a million dollars. A billion is almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. A trillion is 629 miles. That's farther than from Pittsburgh to St. Louis. A quadrillion is a thousand times that, 629,000 miles. That's a stack of $100 bills lying flat that could go to the moon and back two and a half times. This is Looney Tune stuff, folks. I mean, I, I don't know how they can say this stuff with a straight face. I mean, we're talking about things that are just outside the realm of possibility or credibility, but they, 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 keep, they keep pushing the same agenda. It's uh, absolutely unfathomable to me. Okay. Um, you know, winds, wind energy, for example, supposed to be a big saver. Well, of course, you're probably aware there's a controversy now that the wind turbines rotating off the, off the Atlantic coast, off of New Jersey, is killing whales. Well, we, we've known for a long time that they're harmful to wildlife. They chop up birds. The way they shift air pressure makes the lungs of bat explode, bats explode. Gave me an idea for a Hollywood movie. You may remember back in the 90s, there was a Kevin Costner movie called Waterworld. You know, the world was gonna get so warm that 
all the ice caps would melt and basically the world's surface would be an, an ocean. Uh, unfortunately for them, the rate of increase in sea level rise is still only about 1.5 millimeters a year. In other words, it could take over six centuries for the sea level to rise a meter. That'll give us plenty of time to adjust to the places where you know, we need to build up the shores. The problem is more serious in places like the Louisiana Bayou and the Chesapeake Bay. Water, the sea level seems to be rising higher there, but how can that be? Because water always levels out, right? So how can, how can the water level rise in some parts of the coast and not in other parts of the coast? It's not because of what the water's doing. It's because the land is subsiding, an entirely different problem, not caused by the climate, but by ca caused by human usage of water tables under the water and, and building on top of the soft land and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, the, the, the water world thing was a total myth. My idea, if any of you ever wanted to write a screenplay, I, we can talk about this. Imagine we've finally covered all the, the Great Plains with enough wind turbines to provide power for the whole United States. No more oil and gas. Well, except to help manufacture and transport these things, but we, that's details, details. But you cover the land mass with wind turbines, but the wind turbines kill birds and bats. There goes your insect control. Do you want runaway insect population growth on the Great Plains? No more food for the people, starvation. So that would be my horror story for Hollywood. I mean, it just, um, it's not gonna come to that. These, these things that are patently absurd, you know, if something can't happen, it isn't going to happen. It, it just, the insanity couldn't go that far. So I've mentioned some of the dollar costs unfathomable amounts as high as one quadrillion dollars. But as an economist, I think it behooves us to pay attention to the human costs. One of the things that the United Nations is trying to do is to keep some of the poorer countries, especially in Africa, from using fossil fuels even though everybody knows it was the availability of those fossil fuels that propelled the rapid economic development of North America, Europe, and other places on the globe. Well, no, no, but, but we've we got a potential climate crisis here, so we, ju we just gotta stop, but we'll, 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 we'll pay you off, which usually means bribing corrupt leaders and letting the, the people languish in poverty. I was glad this last December after that confab that they had, the UN had about climate in Egypt where they imported 10,000 kids to, to uh, you know, urge their parents to action. Uh, a very cynical maneuver in, in, in my opinion, and practically amounts to child abuse. But at that IPCC annual gathering, the president of Uganda, Yuweri Museveni, just absolutely condemned the West for its double standard. You know, they, they need access to energy. And he says, we need access to energy a whole lot more than we need financial handouts. You know, it's, it's, it's not money per se that's going to power their economies, it's energy. And they wanna use the same energy sources that we used to get developed. That China is using, I mean, China is just burning coal like there's no tomorrow. So who are the folks in the United Nations to presume to tell the Africans, sorry, we've already gone up the economic development ladder, but we want you to stay down there at the bottom. So I'm, I'm totally with this African president who's just saying to these, these people, you know, get rid of your neo-colonialist, neo-imperialist attitudes and let us be your equals. Let, let, a, let, let us have our turn. So, one of the things that this climate alarmist agenda is doing, it, it, it is trying to put the brakes. It's impeding 
the economic development of some of the poor countries of the world. Then there's the loss to our freedom, the, the, the censorship that takes place in the name of climate change. You know, we're, we're seeing this now, the expose of YouTube and Twitter and these other outfits that try to steer you away from reading anything that would question official science. The bottom paid for you know, government interpretation of things. It's a war against free speech. Again, this isn't about saving the climate. This is about people amassing more power to themselves. Several times over the years, I've been interviewed on the radio, I've, I've written for various publications, expressing the case why we shouldn't be alarmed about the fact that the climate is changing. And it, it is changing. And as, as I told you before, we're several degrees away from any danger zone that we've known before. And I've always, always asked, have you ever received any money from oil and gas companies or, or coal companies from, from the fossil fuel industry? It was like, yeah, they're, they, they question your integrity. Maybe that guy Hendrickson's been corrupted by fossil fuels. And I always told him, I said, look, I'll answer your question. And the answer is no, I wasn't on any payrolls. But what I'd like you to do is the next time you interview somebody who's pushing the alarmist agenda, will you please ask them if they've received any money in government grants or if they work for an organization that receives government grants? You see, there's such a bias there thinking that if somebody is skeptical about the dangers of global warming, they must be corrupt. There must be dirty money influencing the guy. Oh, but the people who are talking about global warming, sounding the alarm, saying we need to radically re revise human society, well, you got to trust them implicitly, right? I mean, even if they're getting a government grant, they they wouldn't be pursuing some selfish agenda, would they? Money wouldn't corrupt them. Government money doesn't corrupt, but private money does corrupt. That's the double standard. And I, I've had one or two media people, I remember one guy in particular, he contacted me several years later. He says, you know, I've never forgotten you said that to me. The, 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 the bias and the censorship is, is awful. And of course, the way they want to regiment our lives, you know, no more airplanes, uh, limiting how often we can take trips. I mean, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio will still fly in his private jet. John Kerry will still fly in a private jet to go all over the world to tell us to stay home. But I think we'd rather be able to move about freely ourselves. And I think I mentioned child abuse earlier. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal just a week or two ago about how widespread depression has become among teenagers in our country. Well, good golly, we're battering them with all sorts of gloom and doom all the time, especially in the schools in regard to climate change. The first Bush, George H.W. Bush in 1990 or 1991, signed legislation that gave the Environmental Protection Agency, which is rather zealous, and I consider it a rogue agency with a lot of the radical things they try to impose on people. They've got the charge of the environmental curriculum that gets taught in the high schools and grade schools of our country. I had a personal experience with this in the mid nineties. My daughter came home from high school, not too far from Grove City. Oh, I gotta quit using the spray stuff on my hair, you know, because we don't want the CFCs to go up into the atmosphere and, and break apart the ozone. And I said, well, honey, I appreciate your conscientiousness, but you know, they took the CFCs out of the hairspray is about six or seven years ago. You don't have to worry about it. So I said, hmm, they're not teaching accurate information. So I went up to the curricular chairperson development. I, I forget her exact title. I said, could I see your environmental curriculum? She gave it to me. It was, I don't know, 40 pages or whatever. And I was fairly literate on environmental things. And I read through it. It was just littered with errors 
and I think in some cases deliberate lies. And so we've been teaching people for 30 years. And Al Gore was proud of this. He said, he said to the kids, he said, We're, your schools are going to share special knowledge. Your parents don't have, you know, your parents mean well, but they haven't been exposed to the knowledge that we're going to give you in school. That's kind of diabolical. That's underhanded, I'd say. So we the, the schools have been just pounding into our young people this idea that the world is at high risk. And so some woman like AOC comes out as a congressperson you know, comes out with this Green New Deal. I don't agree with any of it, but I have a little bit of sympathy for her in this particular case, because when she came out with it, I think she was still only like 29 years old. She's young enough where she probably went to one of those schools where this was pounded in, that if we don't do something drastic in 10 or 20 years, the world's doomed. She was brainwashed. Your kids might be getting brainwashed if they go to a, a public school. It wouldn't hurt for you to go in there and take a look at the environmental curriculum and vet it by somebody who really understands it. Um, we should not be teaching our young people that the world is on the brink of doom. That is a depressing thought, but there's no evidence that it is. So why are we tormenting our young people? See, I think this is child abuse. It's certainly professional malpractice. The teachers are trying to drill in a cockamamie theory that has no basis in fact. The only scientific basis that it allegedly has is these computer models that show the world's going to get warmer. But every time you take one of those computer models and backdate it and use existing empirical measurements of actual temperatures, you realize that the computer program cannot account. It, do, it doesn't conform to the changes that actually happen in reality. In other words, it's a bogus model. So we're going to spend hundreds of trillions of dollars to try to change the climate when we don't even have a computer model that shows how the, you know, what causes the temperature to change? And is it CO2? Maybe this will be some repetition for some of you, but just the elementary science of it. You know, I told you there were times in previous ice ages where carbon dioxide was way up and the earth's temperature was way below today. It's happened more recently. You know, we've been increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from a level in the 1800s where it was only about 130 parts per million above where life would go extinct on Earth. I mean, we, 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 it was a carbon dioxide impoverished atmosphere. Now it's healthier today at 420 and be twice as healthy at 800. It, it's to, to say that that's the, the thermostat that controls Earth's temperature is total nonsense. It is, they, they're talking about the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide is not even the main greenhouse gas. Water vapor is by far. But the greenhouse effect isn't the only thing affecting the world's temperature. The number one cause is fluctuations in solar energy. Another major cause is cloud cover, which is influenced by everything from volcanic activity, which we can't control, to cosmic rays hitting the Earth's atmosphere from outer space. And we can't control, I, I know this congressman wants to save the world, but he can't control cosmic rays. Ocean currents that change, tilts in the Earth's orbit. Um, El Ninos, you know, we'll have a hot year from an El Nino. What's an El Nino? Well, it, it warms in an area of the Pacific. Now, how does that happen? It's not because of global warming, because heat, if you know this from elementary physics, heat diffuses. It's like water finding a common level. Heat diffuses evenly through the atmosphere. It doesn't all, the heat doesn't get together and say, oh, let's go to the Eastern Pacific and, 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 and park ourselves there and make the water there warmer. So if the atmosphere can't make one spot or one area of the ocean warmer, what can? I figured this one out even before I studied it. It's something happening 
under the water. What could that be? Well, did you know that there are 3.4 million volcanoes under the world's oceans? And a lot of them are active. And between volcanic eruptions and shifts in plate tectonics, letting magma come up from the Earth's core, yeah, there's some heat coming into our oceans and then maybe a little bit of it escaping into the atmosphere. But that's not because humans drive SUVs. It's not like that at all. Um, I want to just wrap it up by a few concluding remarks. Oh, other human costs is a lot of these renewables require minerals like cobalt, manganese, copper, uh, rare earth elements. They come from different parts of the earth where there's child labor, where there's slave labor, where there aren't any economic regulations and so they just devastate the environment. And there's a lot of costs to green energy. And so we just have to get beyond this point of fearing human growth and human progress. A lot of it, this goes back to Paul Ehrlich in the 60s, you know, the population bomb. He, he says, there are basically two evils in the world. There are too many people and those people have too high a standard of living. So which one of you wants to join me in reducing the world's population? That sure sounds like a call to genocide. Sorry, I'm not into that. Which one of you wants to join me in marching for more poverty around the world? Of course, the poorer a society is, the shorter life expectancy is. Poverty is a very lethal atmosphere for human beings. Any of you want to join me in that? I don't think so. I sure don't. So, um, you know, and these people don't understand that capitalism helps because capitalism has created the wealth that enables us to handle pollution. There's something in economics called the Kuznets curve. It's named after Simon Kuznets. When a society first develops economically, it does generate more pollution. But then people get to a certain standard of living and they go, man, we got to take better care of our air, our water, our land. And they start spending for pollution controls. And the pollution goes back down because we can afford to pay for it to go back. Now, capitalism is the answer. More people is the answer. We, you, we've got more people living at a higher standard of living than ever before. People are a blessing to the earth, not a curse on the earth like the environmental pagans think. And I just looked at the clock, it's 829. So I might've eaten into the question. I may, maybe Aaron will let us go a few, uh, a few minutes longer here. So Aaron, if you wanna ask people for Q and A, if anybody's handed anything in, uh, I'll see what I can do with them some questions. Sure, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to either uh, unmute your mic real quick and, uh, or type a question into the chat. I'd also like to remind everybody that if you would like to be uh, reached about previous recordings and then future episodes for this uh, uh, session of economics, then please type in your email into the chat and we will reach to, out to you and get you material. And if I could add to that, make a wish list. If there's a certain topic you think I should address, if I have some understanding with it, I'll, I'll, I'll share my thoughts with you. If I don't, I'll admit it. Because <laughs> the longer you live, the more you realize how much you don't know. Hey, Dr. Henderson, sir, this is uh, Brad Butler calling. I just wanted to go ahead and thank you for uh, what you do for the, done for the college for all those years and then the broader uh, economics vision and the messaging that you've had. So uh, I've enjoyed it. I've missed a couple of the earlier sessions, unfortunately, but I'll try to call again when I can. I also still get the Allied News for years. I was a 76th grad at the Grove City College and then grew up in town, so I still get the Allied News. And uh, so I appreciate your op-eds there, sir, and the things that you do, very thoughtful pieces that get published there. So thanks for what you do to keep pushing the right uh, message along. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Hey, Mark, this is Don Smith from Visalia, California. 
And uh, I also want to thank you for what you're doing. I've appreciated your uh, series that you're doing here. Uh, my question is, is how do we overcome the alarmists and how do we educate the populace uh, more uh, intensely so we can get a different message out? Uh, you know, are there resources that are out there that we can speak to these things in our community? Uh, with other people, that type of thing, that we can share the truth about? Thank you for that question, Don, because I, I meant to give you a couple of sources during my talk, and I neglected to do so. Probably the leading organization is the Heartland Institute. I think their website is just heartland.org. But anyhow, if you look up, if you Google the Heartland Institute, they're a good source. But I love the, uh, the website, what's up with that.com. But the what, the Watts is uh, a man named Anthony Watts does it. So he, it's a play on words. It sounds like what's up with that, but it's Watts, uh, W A T T S, up with that.com. That's a good source. And then there's a fellow who produces videos named Tony Heller. And one of my, I mean, he, he just does fantastic sometimes five minutes, sometimes you know, 10 or 12 minute videos. One of his best, I think, because it, it shows how these organizations will actually massage the data. Oh. You know, there was that, that climate gate scandal in 2009 where some of the advocates of global warming were the alarmists were caught fudging, you know, lying. <laughs> they were falsifying figures and data. And uh, Tony Heller has one that shows examples of that. NASA does it sometimes. The NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration does it. It's called, um, the one I like so much is called, uh, it's something about everywhere. Oh, golly. I thought you have written down somewhere. Everywhere is warming twice as fast as everywhere else. I think. Like put it out there that it's okay that talk about women being hot uh, got, got got a straight voice here if you can mute yourself please um yeah the tony heller uh, every everywhere is warming twice as fast as everywhere else <laughs> which of course is an impossibility but it shows the kind of hype that we're dealing with but then he actually gives hard data about temperatures and how they're being massaged by the way there, there's a very interesting legal thing. The Wall Street Journal pointed this out in 2004. I just mentioned NOAA, the National Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Administration. They were deliberately, explicitly exempted from a law that was passed in, in 2004 that was telling the government that they had to be sure to use sound scientific data. And yet here a government agency is exempt from that law. I can't think of any other reason why that would happen unless they wanted to give these people, you know, James Bond had a license to kill, NOAA has a license to lie. Awful, yeah. but it doesn't. So Tony Heller, his videos, good source. What's up with that? Heartland Institute. Um, CFACT, I mentioned, they published my book, I should have mentioned it first. Uh, Committee for Constructive Tomorrow is C. Fact, C-F-A-C-T dot org. And there's also a weekly newsletter that summarizes and collates a lot of the latest research. Um, S-E-P-P, -P, Peter Peter, S-E-P-P dot org, I think is the website. If nothing else, research that. I don't even, it's been so long since I've seen what those initials stand for. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. But they send out an email every weekend and they, they just, I mean, what a treasure trove of information. But also, Don, how, what can you do? I mean, share some of these things with other people, but we should be a little bit optimistic because every time they take surveys of the American public about climate change, it's always a low priority. And it's like, well, how much are you willing to spend to avert climate disaster? 
10 bucks a month? No, I don't think so. So I think the American people smell something fishy here. And the alarmists are going to be a little bit like the boy who cried wolf. They've been crying wolf for so long and the wolf never comes. People are going to quit believing them. And, and there are various, um, not surveys, but uh, petitions or documents being circulated online, uh, some signed by 1,500 scientists. The Oregon one had one years ago signed by over 30,000 of them. Uh, this SEP, this weekly newsletter, I read about scientists in different countries, all speaking out against global warming. You know, it's just the echo chamber of the United States media that amplifies it, that makes it seem more real than it really is. It's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's, you, you strip away the curtain, there's not a whole lot there. So, and, and, and the old cliche, you know, truth will out. I mean, the, the truth the last, errors eventually crack up and are corrected by the truth. So, while these people, while we should be very concerned about the ridiculous agenda, the threatening agenda, the freedom crushing agenda that these utopian planners have, they don't really have any a leg to stand on when it just comes to a real a realistic assessment of how the world works. So we, we've got truth and reality on our side. Those are powerful allies. Amen. I agree with that. Thank you. I also read your uh, commentaries in Epic Times, so that's another good source. So, yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah, I just, my daughter just left today. She was here from England for two and a half weeks. So I haven't written anything for Epic yet this month. So you just reminded me, Don, I need to, I need to get back to my keyboard and send something over to the next few days. I think well, that seems to be it, Dr. Hendrickson. Okay, sounds good. I'll just say goodnight.